Welcome, everybody. My name is Seamus Ford. I'm Landmark's Director of Community Engagement. Uh, today, our guest is Dr. Bert Peterson. He's a cancer surgeon and the Director of Breast Surgery at St. Barnabas Hospital in the Bronx, New York. And he's also the co-founder and CEO of Africa Cancer Control Partners, which is an international organization whose mission is to reduce cancer incidence and mortality in developing nations. In addition to that, he's the co-founder of the Charlotte Himmelman Cancer Institute in St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands, which provides cancer treatment to residents of the Eastern Caribbean, which until recently required very long distance travel and separation from family in order to receive cancer care. You know, with the incredible advances in cancer treatment in the last few decades and the massive improvement in patient outcomes, it's easy to forget that for many people who don't have access to this treatment, cancer in its many forms remains just as devastating as it's always been for about half the world's population. And Dr. Burt's deeply committed to eliminating these disparities in cancer outcomes at both the local and the global level. And his latest initiative is the Africa Continental Cancer Center and Research Institute. It's the first fully comprehensive treatment and research institute dedicated to, to preventing, diagnosing, treating, and researching cancer in people of African ancestry. Uh, and then among the multitude of commitments that Bert obviously has, he's also a senior program leader for Landmark. Uh, so really, uh, Bert, welcome and thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Seamus. It's, it's great to be here. Um, Bert, I think uh, what we really should just start with is, you know, you're a doctor. You've mm -hmm. traveled the world, but, you know, can you share a little bit with us about, you know, your own journey to to the practice of medicine and particularly oncology? Sure. So I um, I was born in the Virgin Islands, in the United States Virgin Islands, on the island of St. Thomas. And I think, I don't remember not ever wanting to be a doctor. Um, you know, I may have wanted to be an astronaut and a fireman and the president of the United States, but always and a doctor, you know what I'm saying? It was always that thing. I think part of it um, had to do with the fact that I had childhood asthma and I was, um, really um, inspired and moved by the fact that my pediatrician would make me feel better and I wanted to be someone like him. Um, and over time, I never lost that interest in wanting to be a physician. Um, so I went off to college. I went to college at Johns Hopkins University and went to medical school at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Um, and during that time, it became clear I wanted to be a surgeon. I had been inspired by someone who had become a very good mentor to me. And he happened to be someone whose practice was that of cancer surgery. Um, and even though I had thought I'd be a plastic surgeon or cardiothoracic surgeon, eventually I landed on cancer surgery. And the thing about surgical oncology, as it's formally known that I like, is the fact that unlike other aspects of surgery where you might operate on someone and you never see them again, um, in surgical oncology, that's your patient for life. So I'm always taking care of these patients through the diagnosis, the treatment, and even during that time after where, you know, we hope that they remain cancer-free for the rest of their life. So um, I, I love the continuity of care. So that's pretty much um, how I came here. I came through a public school system growing up. And then um, when I came to New York, to train in cancer surgery. I've never left New York per se. I mean, I've pretty much always practiced in this general area uh, in, the, in the upper Northeast region. Uh, the multitude of initiatives that you have, I think it would be helpful just to say a little bit about uh, you know, the ones that we covered and then also ones that frankly, I didn't have time to put into your journey. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I think the one, that you you mentioned, which was the Charlotte Kimmelman Cancer Center, was a project that I took on. Um, I guess I was two years in practice, um, and uh, I took it on actually after I did the Lamont Forum. Um, but let me just say the where the interest to to do this came from in 1996 when I went into practice. Um, the very first patient I ever took care of was a woman who left her three children and husband behind in Jamaica to come to New York to receive care for breast cancer. Now, you should know in 1996, 
throughout the entire Caribbean, if a woman got breast cancer, she had one option for treatment, which was mastectomy. There was no breast conservation. You couldn't have a lumpectomy because there was no radiation therapy. There's very little chemotherapy throughout the entire Caribbean uh, to speak of. And so she left her home. And I remember thinking distinctly, this isn't right. Someone should do something about this, you know? Um, and then it happened again. And um, I would go home to St. Thomas on breaks and vacations and stuff like that. And always found myself on radio or television, whoever would listen to me to talk about the fact that we should do something about this problem because it was only getting worse. When I looked at the statistics of what was happening, particularly to people of African ancestry across the globe, it was a war worsening epidemic that uh, was happening. Uh, because despite all of the treatments and despite all of the advances in cancer care, people of African ancestry were faring much worse in terms of access to care, but also survival stage for stage uh, were not doing as well. So anyway, I continue to share about this. Um, eventually ended up in the Lamont Forum, but it was in uh, the second course after the forum, if you haven't done any of Landmark's courses, is a course called the Advanced Course, when you start to get clear about what your life is about. And I remember distinctly in that course saying, okay, this is it. My life is going to be about equal access to quality health care for all people. And the day after the Advanced Course, uh, I still remember where I was. It was 11 o'clock at night. That's when the rakes would go down on the... Um, you know, for long distance calls back then. And I called my mentor um, and I said to him, would you trust me to take on a project to build the first comprehensive cancer center in the Eastern, well, in the Caribbean, at that point in the Caribbean? And he said, yes. And how quickly can you get here? And uh, a month later, I was there presenting um, uh, my my proposal, what I my vision for what I think we should do. Um, and then I set off to trying to convince the government and um, how I was able to raise the money to do that. I mean, you're looking at a guy who I'd never built anything other than with Lego blocks. Um, and I had to learn financing and how you do large scale projects like this. But how I was able to fund the project um, was every, the, every state and territory under the United States flag um, had sued R.J. Reynolds and the tobacco companies in out of North Carolina for cigarette smoking causing cancer and heart disease. And every governor under the United States flag and territory was going to use that money for anything but <laughs> health care. Um, for example, in New York, the governor at the time was going to be rebuilding a bridge with that money. and We had to fight for that money back for health care. Likewise, in the United States Virgin Islands, the governor was going to use that money to pay retroactive wages to government employees. And I got a phone call about this, um, left my practice abruptly in New York, flew to St. Thomas, and, and was allowed to speak on the Senate floor about the tragedy that that would be, that we had a real opportunity to create a real legacy for um, not just those of us who exist now, but those of us coming in the future um, that would be affected by uh, a possible diagnosis of cancer. We had a real opportunity to create a legacy project. Um, and it took something uh, to convince the entire population of the US Virgin Islands to give back that money from their paycheck, but they did. Um, they all, the people went to the polls uh, and voted to give that money back. And I was able, every, I was able to leverage the money on the bond market and uh, here in New York, and we had enough money to build the first modern state-of-the-art comprehensive cancer center in the Caribbean, which opened in St. Thomas of January in, 2000, uh, to, in 2005, and it had enough money to build the first comprehensive cardiac center on the island of St. Croix with heliport to fly people in in cardiac distress um, a year later. Um, and that's basically how that project, you know, came about. Wow. Well, you know, <laughs> you say you've had no uh, past experience in mm -hmm. uh, creating something like this, and yet, you know, it's it's so multifaceted. Obviously, you didn't do it by yourself. Right. What would you say is the thing that, you know, for those of you who haven't participated around Landmark, one of the things that um, you'll hear often is, 
the possibility or the vision or the commitment that really animates uh, people's actions. And mm -hmm. you obviously had to have people see that opportunity, but what, what was it like to create well, first of all, what were you what were you encountering when you first started that? Given there was all the money allocated in other places, people never considered this. Right. Before. Yeah. No, you're right. And after the advanced course, I did a course called the Self Expression and Leadership Program. And in that course, um, I learned two techniques, so to speak, or aspects of how to bring forth your leadership and to make big projects happen in the world. One was something called a case for action. How do you speak? in such a way that you create a case for people to take action in what you're out to inspire them in. And so that was, you know, learning how to speak in a way that people get left touched, moved and inspired by what you are standing for, what you're out to create. But the other one that was kind of an eye opener for me, which was learn to give away the possibility of the project, give away your leadership. Um, and I really learn how to have other leaders now take this on such that if anything happened to me, God forbid, the project would live on. And that was a really, really key and important moment for me because I'm that guy that does everything by himself. Part of probably why I went into surgery because I'm my own captain of my ship, but I had to learn to give away the leadership, give away the possibility of the project and not have to have the weight of the world on my shoulder by myself. But who else can I enroll, so to speak, in the possibility of what this is all about and have them take ownership? And when that happened, when that happened, the project took off um, uh, with velocity. Well, you know, the, the, uh, that's a very potent uh, the thing that you're speaking about and giving away a project and have people buy into the vision. Is there anything that surprised you? I mean, I, you know, as you describe that, I wouldn't even mm -hmm. know where to start. I, it's, it's almost overwhelming to, to listen to what you did. Mm -hmm. Clearly people were captivated by what you were creating. Is there anything that yeah. surprised you about people's reaction to it? Yeah. What surprised me was the people who I thought would obviously step up and take ownership and leadership didn't. I thought the medical community, for example, would have been the first set of people that have been my partners. And yet it were, they were just, you know, just everyday folks just got on board. In fact, how I found out about that money from the tobacco settlement company going to pay retroactive wages to government employees was just someone called me one day in my office and said, Dr. Peterson, did you know this is happening down here in St. Thomas? And I was like, what? And this was not a community leader. It's just someone who just called me with just to share because she said, because you're always on the radio talking about this. And I just wanted you to know, because I'm inspired by what you're doing. Like, I just and that changed the whole trajectory of this project because up until then there was no money, you know, to do it. And a regular person, no one is regular, that's a bad term, but just I want to say just someone who would not don't even see themselves, you know, but didn't realize in the moment the difference that one phone call made to me because they took on ownership of this project with me in that way. Yeah. I'd imagine that the, the 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 regular people i mean i would consider mm -hmm. myself a regular person yeah is there anybody who's not touched by cancer exactly you know what i'm saying you either you yourself you have a family member you know someone um it, it's 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 i don't think anyone has not been touched by uh the diagnosis of cancer so um Again, and I think that's part of what surprised me. I thought, oh, everybody was going to be like, go Dr. Peterson. And it wasn't like that. You know, uh, it was a little surprising to me that people, you know, didn't just jump on board. But, you know, one of the things that I got was there was nothing to make wrong about it. It was, okay, I just had to keep doing the work to, you know, to inspire people and build agreement, you know, to little by little, get more and more people on the that critical critical mass of people to say yes. And once that critical mass happened, you know, it, it took off. Well, you you we'll talk about this in a little bit, but with um the 
Africa Continental Cancer Center and Research Institute, you've taken this on at a, at a whole other level. Um, right. But before we get into that, um, you know, there, I, just to give people a little bit more of a picture about cancer treatment and, uh, you know, there's a lot of opinions about what causes cancer, you know, sure. industrial compounds, processed food, bad attitudes, longer lifespans. But uh, can you just share a little bit of the, you know, scientific consensus of what's happening with cancer today? Um, in terms of the treatment or what causes it or? I, both, because they're kind of. Yeah, they're, yeah I, I think I think. At its core, what causes cancer is a genetic alteration in some cell in the body. So skin cancer, as a child, you were exposed to too much sun, your skin cells have been damaged, and that started the process. Most people think skin cancer is when you get it as an adult, it happened, no, it started, the damage started as a child. So for example, in Australia, they have a national campaign where kids are not allowed to go out for recess unless they're wearing sunscreen, you know, because it's a very fair population below the, the equator. But so there are different things in colorectal cancer. We know diet plays a, a difference with that. In breast cancer, we know that there are genetic alterations in the cells of the body that causes these cells to now grow out of control, grow in an uh, uh, in, in a mutated way. One of the things that we've learned over time is that there are a lot of these things that you recently mentioned, the things in the environment, toxins, things that were, you know, food, uh, stress has now shown to make a difference with that. There are a number of different things that we now know contribute to this. And it's important for us to continue to do that work to better understand. I mean, I think 20 years ago when I was first coming into this field, actually it's almost 30 now, if, you know, when you would talk about things like stress and food, people would be like, you know, like, they, you know, they, now we now know that all these things make a difference. Where cancer treatment is now and where it's rapidly moving, it's in the direction of what we call targeted therapy. Because the statement that I made at the beginning, which is all of this is a breakdown in the DNA of the cell, we're now able to target specifically your cancer, the tumor itself, and you, and where we're moving in a direction is fixing and addressing the genetic alterations to actually now treat the cancer. And I think eventually, I do believe at some point, we're going to get to the point where we can reverse um, what has been happening. Hmm. Well, it, let, let's talk about the the disparity in outcomes that people have. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I said a little bit about, you know, so many places in the world, people don't have access to that kind of care. Sure, sure. The, uh, the Africa Continental Cancer Center and Research Institute, um, it's a couple letters off of... Uh, a <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's we it's Acre, which will be built in Accra, <laughs> which is the capital of Ghana. Uh, let me just say that that project um, came about simultaneously, concurrently with me building the cancer center in St. Thomas. I was also chairman of the board of the American Cancer Society for Upper Manhattan, um, and addressing the disparities in healthcare in Upper Manhattan here in Harlem, where we were seeing. Uh, Harlem and and all other black and brown communities where we were seeing higher incidences of cancer and a higher death rate from cancer. So I had had a lot of different uh, really innovative projects. Like I, I had a beauty parlor project where I was training uh, beauticians to talk about breast cancer screening. Um, I had the church weight loss because um, we know obesity contributes to cancer as well. So I had all of the black churches in upper Manhattan competing against each other every year, like who could lose the most weight per church. So depending on how many people lined up and then we would, you know, just to, and then we were promoting health. Uh, and when you think about a lot of the things that cause cancer, by the way, they also contribute to diabetes and heart disease. So I was getting, you know, multiple benefits. And then there was my barbershop quartet project where I was going to barbershops and screening black men 
uh, or, or men coming into black barber shops for, we weren't singing for a quartet of diseases, prostate cancer, colon cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. While I'm doing all of this, I started paying more and more attention to what was happening to people of African ancestry across the globe. And Africa, Africa came on the screen for me for two reasons. One, it was just the, the rate at which cancer has been escalating on the continent of Africa. And Africa is projected to continue to lead the world well beyond 20, 2040 in incidence of, of cancer and the death rate from cancer. But I also looked at, I could see back in 2005 when I decided I was gonna do something about this, it was clear to me that if we're ever gonna make a difference with it, we've got to study the genetics of cancer. And what better place to deal with this issue for people of African ancestry, but to go back to the continent and deal with it where so many of us throughout the African diaspora came from. Um, and so one of the things that's unique about this project that I'm doing in Africa is that for the first time ever in the history um, of medicine, there will be a genomic biorepository for African DNA. No one has ever paid attention to actually collecting African DNA like the rest of the world has been doing to better understand diseases affecting people of African ancestry. And what's ironic about this, Seamus, you may or people who are listening may not realize every laboratory in the world every laboratory in the world just about uses a cell called the HeLa cell. This HeLa cell has been used to advance medicine, advance science. It has created drugs, not only in cancer, but in heart disease and neuromuscular diseases. The HeLa cell stands, it's got, got its name from a woman by the name of Henrietta Lacks. She was a black woman who was diagnosed with cervical cancer in the 40s, maybe early 50s at Johns Hopkins University, my alma mater, her cervical cancer cells were taken from her without her consent. They are the only immortal cell line in the world. Mm. And these cells, you cannot kill them. They continue to live on. And the DNA of a Black woman has actually been something that has revolutionized medicine in terms of the difference these cells have made. And, and it's always been this thing that, you know, it's been out there, but no one has acknowledged. And it was important for me back in 2005 to start to speak to African leaders about the importance of us. It wasn't just enough to diagnose cancer and treat cancer. We have to start to look at how can we better research this disease that is wiping out the continent? Because by the way, most people think of Africa as a continent of infectious diseases, when in fact more people are dying from cancer than AIDS, TB, and malaria combined. But where most people put their attention when they are do, uh, do, dealing with healthcare in Africa is to deal with infectious diseases. And it's not the case in terms of what's actually happening on the ground. So I know this is a long answer, but I'm trying to give you the whole, how this all comes together. And well, so it's, DNA... it's, it's, a, it's a great answer. It's provoked a number of questions. There's, a, yeah. there's one in the chat I just want to ask right away because you talked about yeah. um, the the genome for um, right. people of African descent. Right. Uh, there's a question, why do so many Black men get prostate cancer? Yeah, again, this these are some of the questions that we need to answer. But one of the things that we know about Black men and Black women, for example, is that the, the sex hormones, testosterone and estrogen, we hold on to these um, hormones and the breakdown products from these hormones much longer than other racial and ethnic groups. So um, with black men, the, the, pro the, the testosterone, it, it, it lingers on, and testosterone is a potent stimulator of prostate cancer. And likewise for black women, estrogen is the same thing. And for example, many people don't realize that while white women have the highest rates of breast cancer in the United States, black women have the highest rates under the age of 40. And we also have seen that with the increase of obesity, for example, in the United States, the average age of menarche, which is when a young girl gets her period, has dropped for black girls from 12 or 13 to eight. So now you've got entering into um, uh, menarche, um, you're seeing the development of the breasts and all this stuff much earlier. 
and the fact that we are affected, we meaning people of African ancestry, affected by these hormones, estrogen and testosterone at a higher rate, it starts to explain some of the aspects of why we see some of these cancers at earlier ages. And like with black men, as a person who asked the question, black men get prostate cancer three times the rate of every other racial and ethnic, ethnic group. Yeah, I have, I have a friend who died from prostate cancer. By the way, a funny thing, Seamus, and for the for, for the for the listening audience, it also explains when we we laugh and we say black don't crack because estrogen and testosterone also have a lot to do with you know youthful appearance and keeping up muscle tone and all that kind of stuff too. Yeah. Um. So the I, I'm there. One person in particular has asked a few questions. I'm just going to go ahead and ask them for her. Mm -hmm. uh, I know people who lived great healthy lives and got cancer at young ages, and it seems it's not always directly related and a mystery too. Like, in other words, all of the all of the right things that you know appear to be the um, give you the best odds, and yet people are still getting cancer. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact. Um, you know, vegans and athletes, you know, uh, get breast cancer and they get cancer. That's why I said we really don't quite understand all of the, but it's not a one and one thing. It could be a number of different things that you may not have even known that you were exposed to that causes. We also know that in some people, it's a genetic uh, thing. You know, it's, it's inherited in their genes. And more and more, we are... Uh, when patients are diagnosed with cancer, we're screening, we're actually drawing their blood and checking for a host of genetic uh, abnormalities that may exist in their DNA that they may have been born with uh, that they don't even know about. So um, these are some of the things that um, we look at as well. I think what we'll do is we'll, there's some just questions of you as an oncologist um, that a, a lot of people have. I think we'll save those for our overtime, overtime sure. course. Sure. Um, but let let's talk about this initiative. I mean, the ambition of it, and you know, I just for me, you know, in 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 reading mm -hmm. uh, the prospectus, and it it's massive. It's ambitious. Right. It's of a, of a, a huge scale. Can you tell us a little bit about your team and you know, really the 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 goals that you have in the coming years? Yeah. Well, let me just say that my my first trip to Africa to deal with this was in 2005. My business partner who is uh, from Nigeria, uh, she's half in, half, uh, mother's from uh, England, father's Nigerian. Uh, and she, I, we met at the American Cancer Society here in New York. We went to Nigeria in 2005 to Abuja to speak to the Minister of Health. Um, and I was using the same model that I used to build a cancer center in the Caribbean, which was to engage government leaders to invest in making this project happen. And then the following year, I went to Ghana. And I think, um, Seamus, there's a reason why I'm giving you the background on this is that I set about to create the team thinking the government was going to be the team that was going to make this happen. So I spent about eight years and with every new leadership, I had to start all over again and I was getting nowhere. And I, I it was about um, eight years or so ago, I realized if I'm ever gonna get this off the ground, I can't depend on the government. And in fact, if you look at what's happening in Africa with some of the big things and across the globe, um, who's actually making the biggest difference is not the government, it's actually private money. Bill Gates, Clinton Foundation, you know, there are a lot of, you know, even, um, 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 uh, Mayor Bloomberg of New York, they're like major, major private money going into d addressing a lot of the, the the problems in the world. So I literally changed my strategy and said, if I'm going to get this done, I'm going to have to actually go out on this on my own and start to create a team of people that's going to help me raise $800 million minimum to make this happen. And so I started putting together a team of people and we sat down and we came up with our strategy and um, and I raised the money to do the business plan, uh, which took a, a significant financial investment. And I work with Chartist, the number one cancer consulting firm in the United States to help me do that. 
And then I started putting together the consortium of architects and contractors and lawyers. So we have the top law firm that handles these healthcare acquisition mergers in the world, the leading law firm in Ghana, um, David Ajaye, who built the Smithsonian Museum for African American History in Washington, D.C. Um, in this picture, you saw that Mr. Joseph Hayford, probably not the one right now, he's the most senior architect in Ghana. And that's what I did. I went about putting an A-list team and got them interested, and they all bought into this. And uh, and then we started working on getting the banks who would actually finance this and the one of the biggest things that's happening for us right now is that um, we have been selected to present this project in front of the African Investment uh, Forum in November, which is kind of like Shark Tank for large scale mm -hmm. projects in the world. It's by invitation only. Um, and you go in, you have about 20 minutes, you present your project and then, you know, these major, major pots of money across the globe are sitting there and they start going, I'm in for a hundred million, I'm in for 200, whatever. And you walk out. So for example, this past year, they, the projects that were invited raised about 44 billion um, in financing. So this was a huge win for us uh, to come into 2024 um, with such um, encouragement from the international banking community uh, to make the project happen. Well, um, you know, you're clearly at a phase that uh, is about gathering resources and, yeah. you know, finding the highest leverage ways to do that. But let's talk a little bit more about the aspects of what the Institute is going to be for. Um, yeah. You know, there's preventing, diagnosing, treating and researching cancer. Yeah. Yeah, uh, let me uh, let me just say something about that because, uh, and I know where you're going and I, I can pick up from there, Seamus. Yes, there's gonna be the outpatient facility, there's gonna be the hospital, there's gonna be the training facility to train nurses and radiation techs. There's gonna be the research facility, including that genomic tissue bank. Um, there's gonna be housing um, for families who have to fly in uh, to receive care. Because remember, this is Africa a continent where 29 of 52 African countries have no access to radiation therapy, um, where you have about two surgeons per 100,000 people, whereas in the United States and developing countries, you have about 35 to 40. Um, in, this, in the United States, for example, we have one linear accelerator, which is the machine that delivers radiation therapy per 250,000 people. In Ghana, for example, with a population of 30 million, you have three and only one would be used in this country. So wh what I'm even proposing right now is like dropping a couple of drops of dye in the ocean. Okay, it's not going to be the answer for everything. So that's part of why there's the housing piece developed uh, for people to, families to come uh, to receive care um, as well as recruiting staff. Um, let me just say that regardless of ability to pay, um, and the business model was based on a very modest income, uh, way below what anyone would pay in the United States, and it was still financially viable. But regardless of your ability to pay, part of this project to shame us, there's a foundation where we're going to be raising money to make sure those people who cannot afford care will get that care. We're not turning anyone away. We know from day one, we're already behind the eight ball with the overwhelming need. Um, I what I also neglected to tell you, two of our biggest partners, and it, it's important for this story, is the University of Ghana, as well as the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission, who has granted us 50 acres of land uh, for this project. And one of the things that we plan to do is they, the land is theirs. There have been some farmers and stuff on there using it right now. We don't really want to get rid of them. We kind of want to have this interrupt this ecosystem where perhaps we're growing corn to use that corn to for biofuels uh, and to have this be a green project, putting people to work in the country and this not just be about treatment. Like how do we change the ecosystem so that we're putting people to work, farm to table, like, you know, there's like a whole many different aspects to this project. Now, having said all of that, the most important thing I want everyone to understand about this project 
is that this is a human resources project. And why projects of this magnitude fail is because in my sleep, I can design a cancer center. I can design a building. I can tell you what equipment needs to go in. But on day one, who's going to be running it? Who's going to be taking care of the patients? So a very, very important aspect of this project. By the way, that's Mr. Hayford on the left, the senior architect in Ghana, in that picture that you're looking at. And the gentleman on the right is a contractor. That's him in bright blue right, in the middle of the picture right there in the second row. Um, anyway, um, a major part of this project is already going out into the world and starting to establish relationships with other universities, with uh, physicians, nurses, technicians, pharmacists that we can recruit back home either permanently or to train people. So for example, I've established relationships with the what we call the historical black colleges and universities in the United States to train people, Howard University, Meharry, Fisk, you know, so on and so forth. So as you said, it's ambitious and there are many different layers and that's why there's so many partners involved to make this happen. You know, there's a question that was asked um, about why so many cancers are di diagnosed so late, like they're caught in the late stage. And I was, you know, in the in the uh, prospectus that we're going to actually give to people, um, mm -hmm. the uh, prevention. I just that's prevention is something that um, has to be a really big part of before people ever show oh, absolutely. up. Absolutely. I mean, if you just take breast cancer, for example, the survival rate of breast cancer in Ghana is 15%. In the United States, it's 85 to 90%. 15% of women survive breast cancer in Ghana. And, you know, the cost of a mammogram could be a month's worth of food, even though it's almost nothing for those of us in developed nations. It could be a month's worth of food for a woman to, to be able to get um, a mammogram, and even if she had the money, where is she going to get it? Depending on where she lives, she may not even have access to getting a mammogram uh, to be screened, you know, let alone uh, being able to afford it. So that's part of um, one of the things that we have to address. And uh, one of the initiatives that I, I created in all of this is something called taking health care to the people, because I think we rely too much on um, um, uh, brick and mortar to deliver health care. And when Liberia was coming out of civil war, one of the things I had created was a whole mobile medical unit using military grade vehicles on tractor trailers where you can traverse large swaths of a country with operating rooms, dental clinics, medical facilities, <laughs> screening facilities. You don't need to have people coming to you. What if we could pull up to some of these large factories, like these mining companies or some of these other farming companies and just take care of people? Because in the Caribbean, by the way, when I was growing up, most of my dental care I received at school. The vans came to the school. So mm -hmm. I'm used to this concept of taking healthcare to the people. So yeah, prevention requires education, but it requires access to the care. And if you don't have access, what are you going to do? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one of the other questions that I wanted to ask is, you know, I look at this, the magnitude of what you've taken on. And of course, I'm a lay person. I don't have your training. I don't have your background. Mm -hmm. and, but it's huge. And cancer itself is not, um, it's not a jovial topic. Mm -hmm. um, yet you're so passionate and so mm -hmm. focused. Yeah. What is it that allows you to remain focused and passionate? Yeah. I think one of the things um, that inspires me the most about it is, you know, I've I've renamed myself an event planner, um, and that is I plan for people's birthdays, and that's what makes me passionate about it. Every year when my patients come back in and celebrate another birthday, that's a win, you know, and um, hmm. I get a little emotional about something because you know Seamus a couple months ago I was leaving the hospital I was I was having a bad day and um 
it was just, I was like, ah, oh, you know, and I was struggling around this project in Africa and thinking it was, it was like something didn't go well. And I'm starting to, um, you know, do this thing, second guessing myself and my phone rang and I looked at the phone and I recognized the last name, but I didn't know who this person was calling. And I answered the phone and the person said, Dr. Peterson, I said, Don, and she said, yes. I said, oh my God, Don, how are you? Um, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't heard from you. Are you doing okay? She goes, yes. And she says, um, so let me tell you who Don Callum is. Don Callum was that woman that left Jamaica 26 years ago to receive care from me. And she, she said to me on the phone, in that moment when I was feeling like low, she said, I just wanted you to know something. She's a very religious woman as well. And she was the reason I actually went back to church back then. And she said to me, something told me in my spirit to call you right now, like I needed to call you. And I wanted you to know, this is what she said to me, on November 12th, 1996, you took me to the operating room and you saved my life. And um, my kids are now grown. You won't even recognize them. Um, I have grandchildren. I literally had to like pull over my car. I couldn't even drive. She was the very first woman I ever took care of with breast cancer 26 years ago. And uh, she invited me to her church, you know, to speak in Atlanta. And I went last June and um, to see her kids grown up and grandchildren. And so when you ask why I'm passionate, that's why I'm passionate because mm -hmm that I could that I could have played that role in her life, you know, and to make that difference for her. And uh, and in many ways she saved mine because first of all, I went back to church because of her. And the second thing is um, if I hadn't met Dawn, who knows where my life would have gone because she was the one that inspired that cancer center in St. Thomas and then here we are. And I, when I, and I actually said to her, I said, Don, do you know what I'm doing because of you and what I've done? And when I shared that with her, she was just like, she's like, me, Dr. Peterson, me? I was like, yeah, you, you, Don, from Jamaica. This is what you did, <laughs> you know? Uh, and it's been a beautiful um, relationship between the two of us. And it was nice to get reacquainted with her oh. again. Um, you know, one of the things about the Landmark Difference Makers interview series is we focus on a commonality that you find among landmark graduates. Just, I'll say it, the simple way I say it is freed up to make a difference, freed up to mm. pursue the difference that they uniquely want to make. And it's as yeah. as there are people. Um, how has participating in landmarks programs supported you? And, you know, obviously faith has supported you. Mm -hmm. but anything you want to say about how, you know, landmark programs have empowered you in this long journey? Yeah, there are a couple of things. The first one for me is um, being able to keep a vision alive. You know, um, you know, you get trained at Landmark to, you know, create yourself as a possibility or as a vision, you create a vision for your life and bringing honor to that, meaning, you know, that you really, no matter what's going on in your head, like I'm not smart enough, or I'm not good enough. Or for me, having come from a mixed heritage background where my father was white, my mother's black and not, you know, for a number of reasons, feeling um, discriminated against. I remember thinking, yeah, I am, I can do this. And I had to do battle with that kind of stuff. So keeping a vision alive and and honoring that and not, these stupid conversations we have in our head is um, is a critical critical piece. I think the other thing for me too, Seamus, is the authenticity. What you're pointing to is allowing yourself to be fully self-expressed and pursuing what really matters to you. You see, I think most of my life I was pursuing what I thought mattered 
to other people. Like I had to, my success was going to be based on how much money I made and the size of my home and the vacations that I take. And, and then I had to give that up because early on in my career, for example, every step of the way for that matter, when I took on um, building that cancer center in St. Thomas, people thought I was crazy. Like, you'll never do that. Then when I took on this project in Africa, you're crazy. You know, nobody's going to be listening to you. And then here we are. But I had to stay true to an honor and be fully self-expressed to share what really mattered to me. I think those are two of the most critical things that I got, you know, from Landmark. And, um, and the authenticity is what allows people to get inspired by what I'm doing. They may not be interested in taking it on, but they surely can get inspired um, by what I'm taking on. And even if they don't get, they they start sharing about it with other people. So those would be two critical things, I think, um, that I got. Mm. Yeah, yeah there, there's a, uh, if you don't mind my saying, there's an audacity to your commitment. I mean, it's so yeah, good. Yeah. And yeah. it's obviously, it's obviously going to get fulfilled when it does long beyond your time here yeah and yeah and i and and that is i think that's a good thing too it is it, it is a bold and and it, it can be the audacity to think that you can do stuff like that but um if if you believe if if you see it for yourself then you have to bring honor to it because notice when and this is for everyone who's you know who's listening to this notice the things that you really always wanted to take on but you thought oh i can't it's too big of a deal but notice you never stop thinking about it it just eats away at you and this was bold and audacious i don't know anything about raising 800 million dollars i didn't go to finance school or business school I, in fact if someone had told me taking some course for three days and an evening i was going to be building cancer centers around the world i'd be like are you crazy that's not what doctors do. I don't have that kind of training, but I tell you, there's something that happens when you get clear about what your life is about. This is a vision for my life. You figure it out. You find the people to make to have you uh, make it happen, and you do become bold and audacious and <laughs> unstoppable, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? Like little things don't get in the way for you anymore. You know? Well, I, I, I think all of us have a. A, a little thing that nags us, something that we mm -hmm. just have that sense, like this mm -hmm. is, I, I want to do something here. What yeah. would you say to somebody who might be listening to this, who, you know, just got in touch with something that they're passionate about? What would be your coaching? Uh, put yourself into some structure to actually develop yourself and to train yourself to actually fulfill on what that is. For me, it was the Landmark Forum and the courses I took at Landmark, but it's really critical because I couldn't do it by myself. I was not gonna do it by myself. You know what I'm saying? Anybody can be great when life is going really well. But in those moments when you're taking on these big things, things happen and it's gonna take something for you to rise up and deal with what it is that you say you're going to do. And that's why it's important to put yourself in a structure where people are going to support you, <clears throat> train and develop you to deal with, because the bigger the vision, the more difficult it's going to be. Uh, and difficult is a, is a relative term. I shouldn't say more difficult, the more work is going to be required. That's a better way of putting it. It's not that it's difficult. It's just requires more work to, to make it happen. <clears throat> Well, I, I just have, I really thank you, Bert. Uh, this is deeply, deeply inspiring. And I want to just make sure that I acknowledge you for a lifetime's commitment. Um, I'm one of those people that's had a lot of people in my family have cancer. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I have a new appreciation for the passion and commitment of all the people in the field that have moved this forward in the, in the, personal passion that it is and the selfless generous act that it is at what as well and i thank you for living your life that way and 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 hey Seamus, look and for everybody i've had major setbacks i've i mean i've i've dealt with serious setbacks um in my life and 
again, why the training has been important as the Navy SEALs say, when life comes at you, you know, people say, I'm going to rise to the occasion. And you don't rise to the occasion. You you sink. And the SEALs will tell you they sink to the level of your, their training. It, cancer doesn't just affect one person. Cancer affects families. It affects relationships. And mm -hmm. uh, as a physician, uh, it, it you must realize that you're not just treating the one patient. Absolutely. And, and it's a really good thing that you're bringing up because one of the things I train my students, medical students and residents is that um, when they come to me and they, you know, talk to me as if we're just treating a breast cancer, I often say to them, no, that is a 68 year old grandmother who, you know, and these are the kind of things that I try to tell them, you're talking to me about her breast cancer, but did you know her daughter-in-law just died of colon cancer. She has become the primary caretaker of her son's kids. And this is impacting why she doesn't want to have surgery because she thinks her son is gonna be left alone and um, she doesn't wanna do that to him. You know, to your point, you have to look at the entire patient who is sitting in front of you. There's a whole lot that goes into, it's not just treating the cancer. It's about, like I said, I'm an event planner. How do I have people live year to year celebrating their life and loving the life that they get to live? It is a lot more that goes into this. And that's why I chose cancer surgery because I get to participate in all aspects of um, a human being's life such that they live a great life and that they're not cancer survivors i'm not a big fan of that you're not so you're living you're someone whose body got afflicted with something called cancer but you get to go on and live yeah. well thank you for not stopping and thank you for joining us today yeah thank you